Hi, welcome to uh, Butler School. Um, this is episode two. So today we're going to look at laying a table. Now, I asked you for um, any questions and things you'd like to be included into the uh, uh, into the future lessons, and I've got a great response. I've got quite a few things that I'm going to try and put in later, um, but I've got one here from uh, Tor Berger. Now I'm hoping I've pronounce your name correctly, sir. Um, but he's asking me on my take on using gloves throughout service. Um, this is a really interesting question because as he points out, it's a question of hygiene and it's a question of looks. Now, for years there's been questions over whether we're using white gloves is hygienic. Because of course the downside of wearing white gloves is that you tend not to be washing your hands. If you touch something with your gloves, um, even though porous materials are actually fairly good for stopping the reproduction of um, bacteria and viruses, but just they're not great, you know, and you could pass something from one surface to another. Having said that, I like white gloves and I like using them, but you have to be really careful. You can't have one pair of white gloves and expect that to last you all night. That's just dirty. You need a fresh pair of gloves for each task you're doing. You also need to think quite carefully about the kind of tasks that you're gonna be wearing them from. For example, if you're clearing dishes, you need a pair for clearing dishes. If you're bringing out clean dishes, clean glasses, whatever, you need a fresh pair, nicely laundered, and laundered in hot water with um, a suitable, um, there's, a, there's hundreds of them, but something like death or the commercial antibacterial liquid in the wash. Now, recently, um, I mean, now I'm just in isolation, but recently when I was still working and looking after my clients, we've actually been trying to get as close to an aseptic environment within the dining room as we can. Now, I know you, there's gonna be a lot of experts out there pointing out that um, a dining room can never be a true aseptic environment, and of course you're right. But I'm just trying to get it as close as I can. Now, rubber gloves, if used correctly, are a great tool. If used incorrectly, they're far worse than just using your bare hands. Because people often think of rubber gloves as an alternative to having clean hands, which is obviously a worst case scenario. Um, but recently what we've been doing is uh, using rubber gloves, fresh, clean rubber gloves, change, disposable ones, changing them all the time. Every time you're touching one sort of thing, throw them away afterwards, swapping for some new ones. You can also wear a mask so you're not breathing over the cutlery and everything while you're laying it up. Um, one of the common misconceptions about masks, people often think they're to stop you catching something from somewhere else. That's not really what they're for. They're to stop you breathing on uh, the things you're touching and the people around you. These are surgical grade gloves. Very good if you can get hold of them. These are the ones with powder, latex with a powder. Uh, these are plastic rather than latex. If you're allergic to latex, they also don't have the powder inside. When you are laying silver on the table, you will need to use some sort of gloves because otherwise you're gonna put your horrible finger marks all over your beautifully polished silver. Even if you're very, very careful and you've got spotlessly clean hands, your hands still have natural oils within the skin. So when you pick up your fork or whatever, even if you're very, very careful and you're picking up just like this, you're still touching it. And that's not a matter of, I'm not at this point talking about bacteria, I'm talking about making marks. Because yes, your hands may be spotlessly clean, you've literally just washed them, but you're still gonna make a mark on that fork, which is no good when you're running a table, when you're laying a table, because people don't want finger marks. So what you need to be is wearing a pair of gloves. I haven't got my really nice gloves here, because they're away at the office, I've got nice monogrammed ones. 
But uh, these ones are very practical because what they do have is a non-slip rubber finish, which is also heat proof. It's another good point when you're using, um, when you're serving, plates tend to come out very hot. So again, you're gonna need to use something to carry the plate. So you could use um, a paper towel, which is then of course is disposable, but you will get through a lot of paper towels if you keep doing that, not great for the environment. Uh, you could use a tea towel or a napkin, which to be honest doesn't look very nice. It looks a bit untidy, a bit messy. So again, gloves are probably the best option. Um, so when you're handling the silver or the glass, make sure you're wearing the gloves. The other thing is you never ever touch the part of the cutlery that's going to go in people's mouths or you avoid it as much as possible is probably a more accurate description. Um, again, I'm sure some etiquette sticklers are going to point out the fact that um, people's um, cutlery shouldn't actually physically go in contact with their mouths, etc, etc. Yes, yes, yes. But realistically, the fork goes in your mouth. Um, so when you're handling the fork, I would recommend sort of pinching it there and the knife, avoid touching the blade. What I've got here is just a little selection, a selection of the sort of accoutrement that you may have uh, when laying up a table. Um, I've got a, a, a closhed terrine here, which um, would be for, for anything, for vegetables, anything else. You might use this when you're serving, or you may be, if you're doing like a service hour, you might go on the table in front of the guests for them to help themselves from the actual physical services for another day. Got some nice things here, like some um, different styles of fish knife. This sort of fish knife you'll see has a uh, scallop, which a little scallop out of it here, which is um, the sort of the act of getting the bones out of the fish as you're eating it. Probably more ornamental than practical, but that's, I believe, the idea behind it. Got another quite nice one here, where you see it's actually got a, a curved blade. But the common thread you'll see with fish forks is they nearly always have this shape here. So we've got three different ones in front of us and they all have exactly the same. Okay. So in a second, we're gonna cloth this table, we're gonna iron it and we're gonna lay it up and we'll just go through some of the really basic stuff just to give you a bit of a, a bit of a tease a bit of a taster of um, what's to come. I'm going to lay this up and then from the comfort of your own home you can try a place setting. Maybe send me some pictures of how you do at home. Maybe you've got some questions, you know, maybe you've got some, um, you know, oyster, oyster cutlery, maybe you've got some um, stuff for escargot. I actually don't have those things here in my home but um, I've love to discuss them with you if we can and um, yeah send me some pictures send me some questions so next you'll see me laying the table thanks very much right so let's have a look at laying a table now to lay a table the first thing you need is a perfectly ironed cloth now in this particular circumstance this is my table and i know it will not be damaged by the heat of the iron Obviously, if you've just put a cloth directly onto a table that could be damaged, you would never ever want to iron directly onto it. Normally, if you are clothing a mahogany table or something similar, you'll put a heat proof mat in between the table and the cloth, but you do always need to be careful. When you're ironing the tablecloth, go from the inside to the outside, to the outside edge like that. Now, this is obviously a very small table because we're improvising in my house, but a large banqueting table, the reason for that would be 
more obvious, but as you see, it wouldn't be possible to reach all the way across from one side to the other. So I'm just going to get this as flat as I can, and then we'll pick it back up and fill in the cover now. Well, at least I've definitely found one advantage of uh, doing this in my own home. It means I can uh, stop and have a little drink. Mm. Beautiful single malt. That's a Talabardin uh, Burgundy finish. I highly recommend that. So, the first we need, thing we need to do is we need to find the centre of the place setting. Obviously, with this table that's incredibly easy to do but when we're extrapolating to larger tables it becomes more difficult all the spacings must be equal things you need to think about when you're doing that is a as i mentioned where the center of the table is but also things like chair legs you certainly don't want to put a lady with a chair leg sort of directly between her legs so you need to do all of the settings to account for that because what you don't want to do is have a setting here and then have to leave an extra big gap for the next setting so it will look wrong you want it to look even all the way along so we will go into that in a lot more detail later but i just want to quickly go through a basic setting right now with you so we've ironed our cloth and the next thing you need is a fresh, clean, well-ironed napkin. Now, I would always recommend that you only use linen napkins. There's various polyester and other man-made fibre ones, which make a lot of claims about not needing to be ironed, not needing to be starched. They don't feel nice in your hands. They don't fold nicely. And because the worst thing is you fold them and then because of the nature of polyester they unfold themselves so you'll fold a whole table full of napkins go and do something come back and find they've all unfolded themselves which will really upset you when you've made all that effort when it comes to napkin folding there's thousands thousands upon thousands of different folds some people will tell you that you should never do a fancy fold napkin. Some people find it a bit trashy, some people think it's not tasteful. I think it looks quite pretty. And I think the most important thing is do whatever your principal, which is what we tend to call the, the boss, the, the guest, uh, do whatever they like. Do what they're gonna enjoy. If they're someone who likes a fancy napkin, do a fancy napkin. If they don't want a fancy napkin, then don't. But today I'm going to do one, and it's the Prince of Wales feathers. So, first we need to fold the napkin into a triangle, and then bring the corners up to the middle. Now, tell me, you tell me, if you put in the comments, would you like me to do a full couple of days on napkin folding. Um, I'd really be interested if that's something that you're interested to learn about. Right, so then we folded both those in the middle and we're going to bring the bottom to about three quarters of the way up. We'll fold that back down on itself like so. Hold it still with your thumbs, flip it round, and basically you're gonna. This is probably the most tricky part, especially if you've got gloves on. You've just got to t tuck it in. If you tuck it in too far, it won't look equal. If you don't tuck it in far enough, it will fall apart. It's just something you're going to have to practice, to be honest. 
and then bring the sides down like peeling a banana. And there we go. So that's an app here. Nice simple one. Nice and quick. To be honest, you're probably going to want to use fairly quick napkin folds. If you've got to fold a hundred of them, you don't want one that's ten minutes per napkin. Now, this is a very handy gadget. This is actually one of our, because <laughs> I'm limited to what I've got right now. This is one of our early prototypes. There's a butler who works for me. Fantastic butler, ex-Palace butler. Used to work at Buckingham Palace. Used to work at Balmoral, and um, by the name of. Um, Duncan Robertson, and he's developed this particular butler stick for our use at Rossi Bespoke Butler School. What you'll see is it's the standard width, it's basically a cloth yard, and it's the standard width of a play setting. That does vary depending on table, as we were just discussing, but it also has this particular shape, which means it pushes to the edge of the table. Now, this works with a square edge table, it also works just as well with a beveled edge table. And this leaves our thumb's width. We always use the rule of thumb when we're looking at how far the cutlery goes from the edge of the table, and this will leave our thumb's width. We're actually making some really beautiful ones of these at the moment. Rosewood and mahogany, well no, not mahogany, we're not allowed mahogany, um, and um, American walnut and various other beautiful woods uh, with brass inserts and different colour um, bases and a little bit of product placement they will actually be up for sale but we'll have a chat about that in a, in a later one. So if you don't have one of these you can use anything else, you can use your thumb, you can use a, uh, a lot of people use um, what I would think of as um, a carpenter's a carpenter's rule, you know one of those ones that fold out um, they do the job very well but just be very very careful because they tend to have brass hinges and the brass hinges can be on the bottom so the last thing you want to do is put that against the side of a, a priceless mahogany table pull it away and then have left a big scratch on it so just be a bit careful if you do use those so we're gonna get the center of our place setting and we can also use this to line up the napkin. Now I've just got some cutlery here. Again, as, as I keep saying, we're, we're a bit limited because it's just my own cutlery in the house here. So it's it's pretty old silver to be honest. It's not um, it's not very impressive. So we're just gonna lay up a simple setting. It's gonna be a starter um, Starter fish main dessert. Okay. Always start on the inside with whatever the last course is, because you you work from the outside in when it comes to eating the courses, and when you're laying it, work the opposite way. Now I'm going to lay this up in the British style. A lot of you will be um, familiar with the American or French style, which has the dessert or pudding cutlery, as it's more correctly termed, at the top of the setting. Um, spoon faces that way. Um, and there's your fork underneath. Now, that, that's all well and good. It's not wrong. It's just a style which is the you know, a foreign style, American style. Now, if you are doing that, like I say, it's perfectly reasonable, perfectly fine. But one thing that's very important is before you come to serve the dessert, the dessert course, pudding course, sweet course, um, make sure that you've brought that cutlery down for the guest. They should never have to bring that cutlery down for themselves. That should always be brought down. Again, of course, we're going to reiterate that several times as we go through the service training. But for today I'm going to trade I'm going to lay up in the British style which means that the pudding cutlery is the first to put down on either side of the napkin. Okay? 
The next course is the main. So that is the next one to go down. You see that this is automatically getting our distance just right. But again, I'll show you how you'll do it without this useful tool as well. The main cutlery is next to go down. Go down. If you're laying a large table, I would recommend that you do, rather than doing one place setting at a time, you do all the pudding spoons, then all the pudding forks, then all the main knives, then all the main forks like that. It's just quicker. You know, think Henry Ford, you know, it's a production line. Then we've got our fish course cutlery. This is a fish knife. Not used everywhere in the world, but still quite popular here in Britain. And then we've got a starter knife next. And remember, you just mirror that on the other side. So there's the main fork. Actually, can, can I just ask you to just come round here and we'll film. Oh, cheers. Oh, slange of ours, we say here in Scotland. So I put the side plate here. Um, this is quite a large side plate, um, or a, a bread and butter plate, as they tend to call it in, in the States. Um, traditionally, I'll point out that it's, it's not really for bread and butter. It's a side plate which is theoretic for, for theoretically for any sort of detritus of the meal. So, for example, if you were having uh, prawns or something like that, anything you didn't want would go on the side plate. Uh, that's why quite often you'll see side plates are not uh, used at all, especially in France, they're not particularly you know, in vogue. So there's your side plate. Another place that the side plate can go is actually above the cutlery. Now this is usually only done when you're using a small side plate. Like I say, this is quite large, this is almost the size of a fish plate. But if you're using a smaller side plate, it can go up here. But I'm going to leave it here for now. Now, sometimes people like to put the napkin on the side plate. More often when it's a flat napkin than a folded napkin, but sometimes people like to put the folded napkin there. It's, uh, it's not a right or wrong. It's just a matter of personal taste. Now, another thing you'll notice is missing is the side knife. Here we have a very nice side knife. Now you've got a couple of choices. Again, if we were doing the, um, dare I say, a restaurant style setting, the, um, the side knife would go on top of the side plate. But as we're doing a more traditional um, British um, castle sort of aristocratic setting, this should go across the top of this. Now, this is basically how your setting would run for almost any menu outside working your way in. Of course, your guests will need a cruet. So salt and pepper and you know mustard or whatever else is appropriate to the dish that you're serving. It's nice if people can have one each. Um, depends really on how many you've got. It might be one between two, it might be one between four. Obviously what you don't want is just two sets of cruets for the whole table because that's an awful lot of passing down for your guests to do. Next, we'll move on to glassware and how we place that. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Just working on my guns, uh, 1001, 1002. Anyway, back to the course.